Well, 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 here I am. Let me just post the thing. Because otherwise people won't know. Uh, this is something that really drives me insane. Uh, what do I do? How do I, what do I, why do they keep changing this? They keep changing everything in Instagram. Okay. There we are. Hello, hello. This is so, it's, it's, I find this so frustrating because I set up, I planned that stream and then I set the camera up correctly. But then when I come back to it to actually make it live, like make it public, I mean, then it forgets my camera setting. And once you're live, you can't switch your camera setting in YouTube. I really should do what Ivan said. I should start to use another software. Anyway, it's not a big deal. It's just annoying because now I have people in another stream. <sighs> anyway, how's y'all? Oh, hello, Jenny. Did I sell the yard lead? No. Shall I show it to you again? Let me seduce you with my wares. Look at how pretty it is. And it's all there for sale. <laughs> Good. Good. So if you want it, sit you see. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, Ellen. Uh, dear mom, your mother now. Um, hello, dear. Nobody will understand that. That's going to sound so weird. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Um, hello, hello, Annabelle. Nice to see you too. Uh, what else do we have? I've been making reviews of inks from an art perspective. Oh, that's cool. I uh, I think that is um, that is something that um, not necessarily necessarily a lot of people do. So. That's awesome. Yes. Yes. Oh, no, I'm always this. It doesn't matter how many vegetables I eat. I'm always this pale. And this is not even that bad. This is this is even worse. Yeah, it's just my complexion. I will say that last night I was home very late because I, I met some friends in a, um, uh, what do you call that? A COVID proof, uh, proofed, I suppose, COVID proof scenario. And um, that was a lot of fun. But then I got back, and it was rather late. And now I'm here to entertain you all. So I'm definitely, um, definitely self-administering some caffeine here. Ah. Yes, yes. I thought I would try to grow out the beard a bit. This is interesting color, but, you know. At some point, this may have to be a matter of some sort of compensation because the hair here is disappearing rather quickly. You can't see it that well, but trust me. So yeah, it's gonna be Esbiary Brown with beard only. It'll happen, trust me. Yes, Jenny, and it could be your home. <laughs> so sorry. Yeah, no. What else do we have? Any thoughts on Leonardo Cuspide? Nope, because I haven't seen it yet. I mean, I've seen pictures, but I haven't actually held it. So I, I don't know. I think it looks cool, um, but um, I haven't I haven't actually held one or been in the same room as one even. Put this down a little bit. So yes, yes, yes. It's uh, how it is. What's your most expensive feeling demonstrator? I like the idea of demonstrators, but they often come off cheap. Uh, well, as these has an M1005, which I think was uh, that was a that's a nice uh, demonstrator, but those were. Wasn't that a special edition they did? 
So they're not they're not necessarily super easily obtainable. I mean, yes, the the um, addition to that is to be fair, I buy cheap pens. Well, then they are more likely to feel cheaper than the somewhat more expensive pen sometimes. Um, but even the, I mean, I have this, the Conan doesn't feel cheap to me. The Opus 88, maybe a little bit more so, although it is a, because the plastic is not 100% clear, the way they, they polished it, for me, that makes it feel a little less plasticky, even though it is very, very clearly plastic. Yeah, so that's something you could check out. Yeah. What else do we have? Just yesterday, obtained a very oddly shaped pen, Delta 80 degree Anniversario Autodromo di Monza. I don't think I've ever seen that one. No. No. Yeah, exactly, Katja, yeah, the, the, the Conan. But they also, they use some strange material, don't they? Isn't it plexiglass or something? I thought it was not the, the traditional plastic, but it is a very nice, um, very clear material, which I really like because you have the, um, given us empty, I can show you. You have that interesting filling system. So it's kind of neat to be able to see all the moving parts. Oh, there we go. I think. I don't, that's why I wouldn't want to get a, a Conant that's not a demonstrator because you have such a fascinating filling system. To each his own, obviously, but I mean, you have such a fun filling system that I would, I would kind of regret not being able to see that. Mm. Yes, Katya, thank you for keeping better track of my pens than I do. Again, it was, it was a bit late last night. There is the Delta Roma Imperiale, which, uh, no, also doesn't really feel cheap to me. And they also make these in colors. There was also a yellow version. That's um, a translucent yellow. This one is polished to an amazing degree, which I really, uh, really like. Very, very clear. Very comfortable. I should ink that up. Huh. Anyway, yes. What else do we have? Uh... Enjoyed your conversation with Pierre. Yes, this was an Instagram live thing, for those of you who may have missed it. Uh, couldn't catch it live, but was glad to listen to it to give it 100% focused attention. Yes, yeah, so it was a two-hour conversation with Pierre Miller of Desiderata Pens. Uh, Pierre uh, uh, enjoyed it a lot. I enjoyed it a lot. Pierre is an amazing person. It's very, very interesting. He has a lot of interests, and I find him really fascinating. So it was, I, I, I thought it would be fun to, to do some sort of live stream together. If you enjoyed it, you may in, uh, uh, appreciate knowing that we have already set up the next one for Wednesday, but because there were some issues with Instagram and because Instagram is a little weird, there are all kinds of, when you do a live stream, Instagram is kind of strange. For example, um, uh, you only have an hour and then they cut you out, which I, I understand for their, their servers, I guess, and such, but um, uh, the, the latest idea is that we will do the next stream through Skype. And that means it will not be live. It will be recorded. And then I'll put it on my YouTube channel. So hopefully that will eliminate some of the, um, the, the lag issues and such. You never know. Skype also has issues. But anyway, let's see what that does. There will be another conversation. Let's see what else we got. Uh, it would be interesting to see a clear pen with a frosted design. Yes, well, I mean, it's a bit frosted, I guess. Because it's not 100% clear. How much of a problem is demonstrators discoloring with ink? I don't know. That depends on you. Um, there, I mean, whether you consider it a problem or not. There are certain inks that will definitely discolor a demonstrator without a doubt, and there are a lot of inks that do not. Um, depending on the specific demonstrator, the material, the ink, etc., there may or may not be discoloration. Whether that discoloration is an, is an issue or not, that of course, that depends on you. Um, but uh, I have found that if you use inks of good quality that are not known to stain, some inks are asking for trouble in a demonstrator. 
if you use proper inks, I mean, I've used this for a while. Uh, I, I don't really see any discoloration. I think I should even be able to take out that mechanism because it does look like it is, there are slots for some sort of tool. I wonder if I should, if I could get something that fits in that. Um, but as you can see, I mean, I don't really see any discoloration. Then on the other hand, there are pens that do. So this Delta, because it's quite precious to me, I only use with Waterman Florida Blue, or the Serenity Blue. That's a washable blue. So that really should not be an issue. But then there are the Conid. I kind of put everything in, I, I, like good quality ink, but I, I put in what I want because I can take that apart completely. There's not an issue either. You do notice, like for example, this this um, Visconti Opera Master, that ink window, let me show you. Let me just, okay, sorry, give me one second. Let's clip on this. Oh, yes, no. Uh, this ink window, that was completely clear. And you can see that that's now a, a brown grayish color that is definitely discolored. I have to be honest, it doesn't bother me, but when you purchase it, it is crystal clear and it discolors, but they use a system, I think, where there's like an inner part and there's an outer part. Uh, I've never tried to take this apart, uh, but that could be an issue, right? To me, it doesn't matter that much because it's an amber pen, so it kind of looks like it's, to me, it looks like it's supposed to look this way. But again, it, it, it used to be clear, so it could, it could be an issue. It could be an issue, but that's a bit, um, it can happen, whether it's an issue that depends on, on you and whether you'll be bothered by that, I think. All right, what else do we have? Thank you, thank you, Stargazer. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you from South Florida. Why not thank you? Thank you to South Florida from Alberta. Which pen would you recommend as a daily pocket pen? The Pilot Custom 74 or the Platinum 3776? As a pocket pen, I, neither of those, because they're not pocket pens. Um, the 3776 is a bit smaller, but it's not a pocket pen. The Custom 74 I, I is bigger. That's a, that's, I, I wouldn't necessarily carry that in a pocket. So f as a pocket pen, neither of those. Do you have an opinion of a Pelican 800 with italic nib? Yes, I do. I had one at some point. Pretty sure. No, it's a 400. I want to say... It's all blurs together now. I think at some point I did have an italic, an M800 with an italic nib. Uh, and the, I found the, the uh, factory italic nibs from Pelican to be very nice because they're quite broad and they really have very nice line variation and it was a very nice writer so I would yeah I would definitely uh, I would definitely recommend those speaking of the M1000 demonstrator do you still any own sorry own any Pelicans no I have no more Pelicans in my personal uh, lineup of pens it's not that it's uh uh, there's anything wrong with them, but I I didn't use them enough with respect to some of the other pens I own to keep them. So no Pelicans, no Mont Blancs. I just don't have need for them. Have you been in touch with Grand Mia pens lately? Lately not, I think. But every interaction with Steph is always a pleasant interaction and always a lot of fun. I should reach out to him and see how he's doing. Hello, hello, hello from Las Vegas. Hello, hello. Thank you for being a long time follower. I appreciate it. Any recommendations where we can get the spare parts of vintage wall pens? Um, usually when I look for parts, and I don't know about wall pens because I don't, I don't own any wall pens, but if, if I look for parts, I go to Penboard, penboard.de, which is operated by Tom Mesterich and some other people who are quite well known in the, in the world of vintage pens. And uh, uh, I don't know, again, I don't know about wall parts, but they do have pen parts. Another source that sometimes 
they, he, it's Dale Beebe, and he has a lot of stuff. It's pentooling.com, but I think he mainly focuses on that, like the actual tools to disassemble pens that he recreates, which is, I think, super cool from the like from the, the original models that Parker used in their factory and that kind of stuff. I think it's really neat. But he also sometimes has some spare parts. Beyond that, you have to look around. eBay sometimes has parts. Pen shows can be very useful, but of course, then you have to have a pen show in your area. Um, and right now, I don't know if anyone has a pen show in the area. There may never be pen shows again in the world. We don't know, right? So that, that would be uh, interesting, but yeah. Hello from the UK. Hello back. Costliest pen that you ever own. Yes, I have owned costly costly pens. Hello, Sima. Nice to see you. Well, nice to not see you, but you know what I mean. Nice to have you here. Uh, Louisiana, we have once again viewers from all over the world. That's kind of neat. Oh, yes, Katya, that's a very good uh, suggestion. Yes, uh, uh, if you like frosted um, demonstrators, check out the uh, the Franklin Christoph uh, uh, malls because they indeed they do have some some demonstrators that have that nice frosting and it, they, their frosting looks very good. I agree. Yes. Any suggestions for a solid gold pen? No, I no, I don't own any, um, and I wouldn't know. No. I use Base State Blue and a Twisby Eco dedicated for that purpose. Yes, that would be an ink that I would dedicate a pen to. Yes, and that's a very intense blue, but, you know, yes. Uh, what else do we have? What is your experience with Stipula fountain pens? Uh, mostly good. I can talk a little bit about the different models I have had or have had access to. I had a Passaporto, which I was not a big fan of. Those are very small. Those are pocket pens. And you you take off the cap and you post it to have something that's about, well, I can't even say it's a normal size pen, but it is. it becomes usable. My issue with that pen, although it's very cute, and it's, I like the idea of small pen because they're really, they're, they're tiny. Like it's something like this. It's very, it's very small, well, no, a little, maybe a little growth here, but, but it's very short. Um, very nice idea. But my issue was that the, for posting the cap, you just push it on and it's not screwed on. I think there was a special edition at some point that did have, uh, have threads. But the regular models don't, and then it's, every time I roll it, the cap just popped off, and I, I, I couldn't really use it. So th that was not that great. I've had a Stipula Model T in graphite, which I sold. It was a very attractive pen uh, uh, with, with oh, a little bit almost like, like an old win in, in shape. Not, not entirely, but in, with the sort of pointed cap and the pointed uh, end of the barrel, which had a titanium nib that was... I think that may have been my first titanium nib. That was a very nice pen. A nice model and very comfortable to use. I have used, well, this is not a super long list, so I'm not going to take up an hour with this. Uh, I have used the Etruria and the Etruria Magnifica. I ended up, I'm pretty sure, ended up selling the uh, Etruria, but the Magnifica I kept, uh, which is here, I think, yes, yeah, which is a little bigger, especially girthier than the, the regular Etruria's and has a piston, I think it's a captive converter, but anyway, um, and which has a very nice anodized titanium nib. Should I show you that up close again? May as well, because I took the thing out in the first place. Which is very interesting, and it's a very nice titanium nib, very, very springy, and a very nice snap back, which is really nice. And that one I like, it's not, it's the alter ego celluloid. Um, I have to admit, this is not a celluloid that I that really blows me away, but I got it for the nib. It's such a superb writer. I really like it. The only faux pas in my mind that that Stipula committed was the um, Splash, which is a dollar pen, which costs a dollar in Pakistan. They got a whole bunch of those and they put some metal parts on and then marked up the price tremendously. And I think that was a bit weird. Yeah, that was it was um it felt very cheap and it was not a pleasant writer. 
Uh, so that's that that no. But beyond that, Stipula, I think they've done really good work. They've done some really nice pens, and uh, when they, it's an Italian company. <clears throat> But when the nibs write really well, then they write really well. And they are very pleasant to use. I had one with a stub that was a superb writer. So really enjoyed that. Yeah. Um, I have a question for the psychologist. Have you come across the Enneagram? And if so, how do you think it compares with, for example, Myers-Briggs? There is very little scientific support for Myers-Briggs, and <clears throat> people always use that as some sort of, I'm not saying you do, but I'm just saying, people often use that as a very well-established scientific measurement tool to, to uh, describe personality. The reality is it has about as much predictive qualities as a fortune cookie. So... It is not a very scientific instrument, and um, that comes as a shock to some people. Myers-Briggs was developed, is interesting. There are all kinds of nitty-gritty methodological details as to why it is not a very good scientific instrument. Uh, a fun one is that most of the research about that instrument is published in a magazine owned by people who are in favor of the Myers-Briggs personality indicator. So that creates a bit of bias. Um, it's also funded by, anyway, there's a lot of things. <clears throat> In a more statistical level, the Myers-Briggs personality uh, indicator, that, that test, has a lot of statistical flaws. Uh, different personality types correlate with each other, which cannot be the case in a personality test that is actually validated. Uh, the validity is severely under question, so it doesn't measure what it's supposed to measure. The reliability is severely under question, which means that it doesn't give consistent results for the same people at different measurement times. So Myers-Briggs is not something that I would consider a scientific instrument. Having said that, if you use Myers-Briggs as an indicator of your personality, and you use that to learn about yourself. Well, there are other tests that would do a better job, but at the very least, you are using that as a tool to learn about yourself and maybe figure out some things you could try to work on, etc. And then you're not using it as a scientist would, right? And that's an important distinction. If you were to use this in scientific research, that is a different application than if you were to use this as a private person is doing that to get an impression. But it is not better than, say, a personality test in Cosmo. Um, the Enneagram is a very similar type of thing. So also not, I would say, founded in really solid research. Uh, and as a result, something of, at best, dubious quality. And I would consider both to be pseudoscience at best. This is a very harsh answer. And I'm not trying to sound mean, but... It is my duty. It was um, affirmed to me when I got my PhD. It is my duty to never forget the obligations a PhD gives you. And that means that sometimes you have to look at whether something is proper science or not. And in the case of these things, it is not proper science. Which doesn't mean, again, that they have no value. But depends a bit on how you use them. It was a very long answer. I apologize for the wordiness. But there we have it. All right. Any reason why we cannot see a Graf von Faber-Castell pen of the year in your personal collection? It's a great writer. They come with great designs. Yes, but they don't really appeal to me. And that is just a personal thing. That's nothing because there's anything. That's sorry. That's not because there's anything wrong with them. It's just a matter that it's almost invariably not a design. Well, it's not a design that really appeals to me. The nibs are fantastic. The Faber-Castell nibs are great. The Graf and Faber-Castell nibs are great. There's no issues there. It's just a matter of I don't I don't really like their uh, their designs, but there's nothing wrong with it, obviously. So it's not like I've had a like a, a falling out with Graf and Faber-Castell. There's nothing, absolutely nothing in those uh, ways. I've just not find them. Also, a lot of the Faber the Graf and Faber-Castell pens are incredibly thin. I just, I just, that just doesn't appeal to me. And the pen of the year is great, but that's 
Kaching, right? What else do we have? Katya says that the uh, ink window of her Homo sapiens crystal is also stained. Yeah, exactly. And she says, I, I, it's not a problem for me because I only use teal turquoise inks in it. Yeah, and once there's ink in it, you don't really see it. It's when it's empty. So I agree. I have the same feeling. Plus, my opinion has always been pens are there to be used, and they will develop some marks of use. They may develop a little scuff or a, a little scratch or a thing or whatever. If not, then what do you have the pen for? If it's just a Put it on a shelf that some people do that and that's fine like that's another way to have an interest in, in collecting fountain pens that's true collecting i think but then i i yeah I, that's not that's not how i would use that it doesn't even make sense when i say it. that's not how i use pens because i use them so there's some things may happen there may be a bit of discoloration there may be a bit of this you know If you would receive a thousand euros, but you have to buy one pen with it. Um, well, I, wouldn't, I don't have the exact amounts in, in mind, but I, I sometimes think of, but it's not really likely to happen. I sometimes think of, I really like the Conid King size, but I have the one with the rounded off ends. I'm pretty sure that if I were to buy a flat top, um, same model that would end up in the range of about a thousand euros. The only problem is <clears throat> I think of these things and I think, yeah, do I don't want to spend that money on something I basically already own. So that's why what I meant by it's most likely not going to happen. But if somebody give it to me, yeah. What else do we have? Have you tried a triple tail yet? No, I have still not tried a triple tail yet, but I am getting one. Brian Goulet has gracious graciously is that the word yeah has graciously sent me one but it's not there but because we're all here let me check where it is oh but they use their own mail system don't they let me see let me see let me see track i don't think it's in canada yet no on august 7th at 9 10 a.m the international item has left the originating country and is en route to canada en route. So there we have it. Once I have it, I will review it. But I think that I currently, so I have to look at that again. I think that I currently have review scheduled for a while. The earliest that will be reviewed is November 16th, because until that point I'm booked. But it will be reviewed, and I'll get two, which I really like, because then I can try two. Because if you, typically you only have one of a pen, and you don't know if there are idiosyncrasies of one pen. So I can treat them both the same way, ink them up the same ink, and then see how they both perform. And one will be given away. Did I mention that? No, one will be given away. That was the idea. Yeah. What would the Mandalorian's preferred pen be? Well, I don't know what the Mandalorian's preferred pen would be, but I would really like to see a Mandalorian pen. I think if, say, Cross, which is doing things anyway with Star Wars, if they were to launch a Mandalorian pen, which I wouldn't be surprised if they do, because that's kind of hot right now, and that's something they could cash in on, that'd be pretty interesting. They would have to have the old armor and the new armor. Imagine a pen with interchangeable bits of armor on it. That would be really, really, really gaudy and strange, but yeah. What else do we have? I carry a Lama Safari in my pocket, no problems there. Well, that's good. Well, in that case, you can get a 3776 or a Pilot 72, and either should work well in your pocket as well. Just got a confirmation email from Vanessa, my prescription of Liquid Arco on its way. Oh, nice. Excellent. I hope you enjoy it. What delicious things did you have today for lunch? Well, honestly, I didn't have lunch yet. Uh, it's only 10.26 a.m. here, but usually after these, these hangouts, I... I Quickly go and scarper. I don't know what yet. I have to think about that. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. You know, what you should really get if you want a pocket pen is this pen, which happens to be for sale. How could I miss it? Yeah, Jenny, you're right. Yeah. No, I mean, I guess theoretically any pen can be used as a pocket pen, but I mean, when I hear pocket pen, then I think of a pen that is marketed as a pocket pen, right? Which is a specific type of pen. And that's it, really. 
Like, I mean, you could, you could use everything. You could use the Miki Emperor as a pocket pen if you really want to. You just need big pockets, but theoretically you could. See what I did there? Um, but yeah, no, yeah. I, 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 I don't know what makes the pocket pens or what makes the pens... I don't know what would be required for something to be carried in a pocket if it is not designed for that um, and what, what features you'd be looking for. If the choice is between a 72 and a 3776, then I guess the 3776 because it's smaller. So if it has to be carried in a pocket, then yes. Nib-wise, one is going to be a very stiff nib. That's the 3776. The other one is um, a somewhat springier nib. But if you're looking for the soft nibs anyway, I really don't think there's going to be much of a difference between the two in quality or performance. So in that regard, I suppose both pens work fine as, as options to carry in any way you like. How do oblique nibs affect writing? Well, quite a lot, because oblique nibs are really meant to be used in a very specific way. Right, people, uh, when people rotate their pens a bit, I don't have an oblique nib here, but it doesn't matter. Some people, when they write, they kind of rotate their nib into the paper a bit. And if you do that, then an oblique nib will help because then it's a better alignment with the paper. But then you are using that in a very specific way. If you do not use that and you want to use an oblique nib, then you have to do that to make the oblique nib right. It won't write like a regular round nib will because you have to have that, that uh, ang angling, yes. Um, otherwise it won't work. So that will affect your writing. It will affect the way you hold the pen and the way you, you, you make the, 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 the turn, how you, how you hold it. What else do we have? Do you still have the Delta Dolce Vita oversize? No, I do not. And it was a very simple uh, reason. I just, I just didn't use it enough. It's a nice... Uh, um, it was a very nice pen. I think they were very, very attractive. But it was... Uh, what I would like in that pen is if it was a little bit longer. Because it's very girthy, but it's quite stocky. Uh, this is personal. I mean, it's nothing. Legit. I would like to see that. But it was a beautiful celluloid. The orange was absolutely stellar. It was a very, very pretty pen. Have you tried cashew milk? Yeah, I don't really drink milk. Um, I do use it in applications like to cook to cook with. Uh, and when I do, I, I, I usually actually use um, almond milk uh, simply because it keeps very well. So I always have some almond milk as opposed to real milk. I mean, like dairy milk. So that's pretty much it. Cashew, I've probably used at some point. I've tried soy milk as well, but I, I, I'm not someone who drinks milk straight up. So if you use it in, a, in a, some sort of preparation where you cook, you have to be a little careful with the flavor, but often I find it works. So when I make pancakes, for example, I always, I always, have, um, I always use almond milk, actually. And it works well. Works well. To me, it always feels a little less fatty, but that's but but that's probably just um, insanity. Katja recommends. So, what I had another recommendation: Swiss B Vac Mini. Oh, sorry, the Mini Vac, whatever the Vac Mini. mini. Anyway, that's a good pocket pen. Yes, it is. And the uh, 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 there's another recommendation for a Sean design, the Pocket Six. That is also a very good one. I like that. Uh, I like the Sean design pens. They're very they're very cute. And they are uh, they're aluminum, aka aluminium. So you you have something that's fairly robust that can can take some uh, being thrown around and scratching in pockets, uh, etc. Do you have any favorite ballpoint or roller ball pens? Um, yeah, I don't have many. I have a favorite roller ball, which I have the feeling I show every week. But this is the Min Inch. Uh, excisors pen, which I really like because it has a pair of scissors in there, which is kind of cute. It's a rollerball pen. Sorry, a ballpoint pen. As a rollerball, um, I, I've been using the Solar from from uh, Laban, which I find comfortable. It's a bit small, but it's it, it actually does post. But it's an aluminum, which is a very it makes a very pleasant material. Plus, I like the looks of it. The I, I like that it's it's not too big. 
I don't use them a whole lot, but I do I do use them sometimes. It is sometimes said that people resemble their pets. Have you found the same to be true with pens? Yeah, but now what conclusion are we to draw? That I am an emperor or that I'm very big. I wish I hadn't said that. Um, that maybe, I don't know. I think I think I also realize that you're probably not 100% sure. With this. It's like, sorry, not 100% um, serious with this question. But I do think that you, you develop... Uh, uh, a flavor in pens, right? And for me, for example, super sleek, industrial-looking metal tubes are not my preferred pens. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just that for me, that's not a look of pen that I typically really enjoy. There have been some exceptions. I mean, I, 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 I do have a... Um, where do I have it? Where is it? Oh, here. This is as industrial as it gets for me. And this is, a, this is an actual pocket pen, which I really like. Very comfortable to use. Uh, the Enso XS pocket pen. It's faceted, which is kind of cute. You can't see that in the section, but it's faceted. This is a titanium model they did, which was limited, uh, but very, very cute, very nice. Works well. I've had no issues with it. Some people complained about the, the O-rings coming off. I've really not experienced it. Um, so that's that's kind of neat, but uh, yeah, this is really something I like. But this is kind of that you have dozens of these on Kickstarter: the minimalist, sleek design, minimalist, minimalist machine, minimalist, minimalist machine. Um, that's great. It's not my type of pen. So what I'm trying to say is my my flavor is a little different when it comes to pens, and it doesn't matter if you do really like the sleek minimalist design, right? I mean, to each his or her own. Um, it's just that that's not the thing for me so i think it's it's not necessarily obviously that you start to look like your pens that your pens look like you but it is a reflection of you and and, and the, the the taste you have in pens and for me in when it comes to pens the looks do matter and that 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 minimalist metal tube like look that that does very little for me personally again it's just a personal thing right what else do we have? Oh, this is a good suggestion for the person who was asking about the solid gold pen. Applebaum sends, sells an Ayrton Senna gold pen, which is solid gold. So there you go. Check it out, applebaum.com. 10% discount through my website, right? That may be useful for a solid gold pen. Uh, hello, hello. Hello, Jerry Weasel. Uh, what else do we have? You know you can fit a normal size pen in a pocket, right? This is a very big issue, isn't it? Yes, I understand that. I understand that. But when you use the term pocket pen, a pocket pen refers to a specific type of pen. So a pocket pen is a pen that is designed to be carried in a pocket. Theoretically, I could take this bottle and stuff it in my pocket, but that doesn't make it a pocket bottle, right? That was all I was trying to say. A pocket pen is something like this. This is a pocket pen. It's marketed as a pocket pen. To be carried in a pocket. The Caveco Sport, you could say, is a pocket pen. And the Mickey Emperor is not a pocket pen. It's not marketed as such, even though I could carry it in a pocket. That's the only point I was trying to make. I wasn't trying to be offensive. I was trying to clarify the terminology that we use. End of story. Okay. Why are pen reviewers so shy about revealing prices? It suggests they are embarrassed to have paid a lot. Well, it's not... It, it depends. Like, in, in, in when I started off reviewing... Um, I, there was an issue and I, I remember that I, I wouldn't always mention the, the prices of pens at that point. That was a bit of a, the, the, the reason for me was that I, I didn't really, uh, initially I wasn't really sent any pens to review. I really purchased the pens that I reviewed and I don't know if it was embarrassment, but even now, I still sometimes feel that when I, I purchase something for myself, which admittedly doesn't happen very often anymore, uh, because I kind of have what I like, right? Um, but I don't always feel the need to 
share the price of something that I myself have purchased. I realize that if you are looking at a review, if you're watching a review, that you will want to know what that pen cost. Sometimes there are specific reasons for me not to mention a price. The simplest reason is that sometimes this is <laughs> what do you call that? attributable to all kinds of potential factors. But it does happen to me occasionally that I buy a pen and that a vendor gives me a discount and sometimes a considerable discount. It also happens that a vendor sometimes says, I will give you this discount, but please don't mention it online. And in that case, I have a reason to not mention that. It's also a bit of a matter is sometimes it's really not someone's business what I paid for a pen, right? I Sometimes the feeling rises that I should share every aspect of my life because I have a YouTube channel, but that's not really how this works. I'm not saying that you're saying this. I'm, I'm just trying to, to provide some context to the story here. So I can imagine that if, for example, you were to buy a new car, you do not go to all your friends and say, I paid this amount for this car, right? So when I review a pen, if that pen is sent to me by a company, then I always mention the price, especially in the... I don't know, but I've been doing this for, for a long time. In the earliest reviews, indeed, I did not. Now I do, because I understand people want to have that information. When it comes to something that I have purchased, I don't always mention the price. Bear in mind, all these prices can be found online, right? So with minimal effort and work, you can actually find the prices. It's just that I don't always feel the need, especially if something is a, a personal pen, which is also the reason I don't answer questions like, what is the most you've ever spent on a pen? Because quite frankly, it's none, none, of, none of anyone's business, really, right? It's not. It's really not. So those questions always go unanswered, and I get them every week here. But that is why. It's just my personal choices, my personal pen collection, and that's it, Right? That's the reason. So is there, is there some sort of uh, embarrassment? <clears throat> well, I don't think I've ever felt embarrassed. I've more felt it's really none of your business. Again, that's not, this is not directed at you. It's not, I'm not, it's not some sort of personal, but it's like, yeah, I, <clears throat> I have paid something for this pen. And I mean, yeah, that's just the way it is. It was a very long answer. But I think that's it, yeah. Um, what else do we have? Any recommendations for Nipmeisters in the UK? Yes, John Soroka. Um, Oxonian on Fountain Network. I don't know how to contact him. I have uh, tried out his work at some point. And that's pretty much it. Very good work. Very good work. But that's that's it. So if you want to contact John. I don't have an email address. I have no information. I don't have a phone number. I don't have a fax number. I don't know where he lives. Found it by network, Oxonian. That's how you find him. If you don't mind going to the Netherlands, there are other uh, options because uh, Applebaum has Annabelle who does uh, uh, Nipmeister work. Uh, but I know you specifically asked about the UK, but I mean, that's the country next door, right? What about yard lead pencils? Do you have a fascination for mechanical pencils? No, I, I really don't. And that's, again, that's just a personal thing. Uh, uh, yard lead has, of course, done uh, very revolutionary work in, in the world of, uh, was mechanical, but it was propelling pencils, actually, I think. I, I, again, this is not something I'm very familiar with, so I probably butcher the terminology. I know they have, and that's great, but I don't, I don't use a lot of pencils. I have a nice... A mechanical pencil which a friend gave me which I still use uh, with much fondness that's pretty much the only thing I use I don't write with pencils I don't I, I barely use pencils but occasionally I do use that for I don't know quickly graphing something or something along those lines what are your thoughts on the corporization and commodification of education and the dying diversity of thought that is a very deep question. Yes, 
I do think that education sometimes becomes a bit more like a corporation. I wonder sometimes how much that truly affects instructors. There definitely are institutions where you are told that you have to graduate as many students as possible. Where I work, that is not the case. I have never been told something like that. I also don't feel that pressure or anything. But yeah, there definitely are such institutions. And that is a problem in my mind because the academy used to be a matter of that is where free thinking takes place. I don't always have the feeling that is the case now. And again, I'm not speaking about my institution because I can genuinely say I don't get that feeling there. But yes, there have been institutions where that is the, is the, the, the case. And that's a shame. Science is about as much objectivity as you can muster about doing work that is as precise, independent, objective as you can make it. And if that disappears, then that is a problem. Uh, the same thing with dying diversity of thought. That is a complicated problem because I... There are certain things that I value a lot in teaching. Critical thought is one of them. Diversity in thought is one of them. Learning to think in a specific manner, in a scientific manner, thinking about the world in a scientific manner is one of those things. But I have to admit that I sometimes also get the feeling that students, no, that some students do not actually care about that. Sometimes a lot of students in a course. So if you ask me what I find, I know this was not your question, but I will gladly bend this in a way that I can say this. Um, if you ask me what I find one of the more uh, annoying things about education and about teaching, then one thing is the immortal attitude of C's get degrees. Yes, they do. And C's get C-level jobs. So if your general attitude is to do the bare minimum to pass everything in life, then that, in my mind, this is my personal opinion, that shines through in everything you do, and then you will be, you will be doing mediocre things in life because you only do everything at the level of, well, it's just enough, just enough, just enough. And many students do not do that. Many students do strive for excellence, and that is fantastic. So I'm not trying to say that all students are like that because that would be an insincere generalization. But that that is an issue. That is an issue, I find. I hope that makes sense. Have you ever discovered the actual permanence of an ink from spilling coffee to your water on an open notebook? Um, I have done it once. I think I actually have done it on my own ink. And I remember it wasn't super successful, but I remember that more remained on the page than was actually expected by me. Because it's not, it's not a waterproof ink. I don't market it as a waterproof ink either. So that was kind of interesting. Um... Oh, this is a nice one. Yeah, do you add lemon juice to any of your teas? I don't do it very often, but I remember that uh, whenever I would be in Germany, when you would order tea in a restaurant or something, you you typically get either a little slice of lemon. Does anyone remember that? With a little lemon squeezer, I would get a little bag of like lemon juice. I don't know how chemical that is, but anyway. I should try. I should try, because I don't know what my taste will... My toy might... Sorry, again, sorry, people. It was pretty late last night. I remember what my teas will taste like with lemon in. I'm going to try. I have done it. I have done it. It was pretty good. Huh. Thank you for the suggestion. Thank you for the reactivation of this memory. Be honest. Do you find it odd or a bit scary that people want to know so much about your per uh, personal life? Let me try to give a really nuanced answer because I don't I don't want to sound mean or... or um, Accusatory when I talk about these things. That, that I, I really, really wanted to, to try and make that point. Um, uh, 
I think what, what sometimes bothers me is the idea that some people, not all, some people seem to have that because I have a YouTube channel, they have a right to know everything about my life. I've probably said this before. But one example was at some point, and I know this was well-intentioned, but at some point when Aziza and I got together, I was contacted by someone who said, are Aziza and you together? If so, you have to announce that because we have a right to know. No, you don't. You do not have a right to know all sorts of intimate details about my personal life, right? So again, this is not meant as a sort of accusatory statement, but, but try, try to picture what it is like, right? Do you go to the neighbors across the street that you don't know, but that you see every day when they leave for work to share all the details of your life? Because I bet you don't, because you don't know those people, right? So if I am online and I do YouTube reviews on fountain pens or paper, that kind of stuff, but let's, let's be fair, more mainly pens, then yes, I publicize certain aspects of my life, right? This is a pen. This is a pen I, I own. I own this pen. But that doesn't mean that I have to share. I'm not saying that you say this either, right? Again, I, I, want, to, I want, want to make sure that, that I say this in as nuanced a, a sense as I can. That doesn't mean that I then have an obligation to share with you every aspect of my life. I had a discussion with a friend about that yesterday who was talking about influencers on Instagram who do, not, not all influencers do it, but these influencers who share everything. And she said how she felt how peculiar that can be because she follows them. They live in her city. She knows the names of their children. And she sees them walking through the city sometimes. And she wants to go up to them because she feels that she knows them. But she also realized that in reality, they don't know her at all right so that it would actually be maybe weird for her to go up to them and talk to them now i sometimes get approached by people if you recognize me you can always come up to me right i'm not trying to say that you shouldn't of course you can and it's always a pleasure to talk to people but you do have to understand that that perspective right and it's not just the sharing of details it's also the matter of that you have watched a lot of my YouTube videos, maybe all my YouTube videos, and there are a lot of YouTube videos, that doesn't mean that we intimately know each other, right? Yes, I give some glimpses in my life. I have no trouble talking about my job, but that's a, <laughs> public anyway. Google it and you will find the, the, my, my course outlines on the Red Deer College website. So yeah, it's public. This is public knowledge. I have no trouble sharing that. But there are certain things in your life, everybody has this. What the hell? Door closed. It startled me. Um, it's just wind, though. Either that or it's a serial killer. Um, so this is probability versus possibility again, right? I think I think it is possible that it was a serial killer shutting my door, slamming it shut, but it's probably just the wind. So everybody has certain aspects of their life, intimate details of their life, that they, like, they don't go tweeting and then some people do or put on Instagram or put on YouTube, right? So striking that balance is difficult sometimes, but it's also a specific decision that Aziza and I made when we got together. I'm, I'm almost done with this. I, I don't want to take up all time with this, but it's, it's a good question. I think requires a, um, a well-argued answer. When Aziza and I got together, we had to make a decision because I use this with an incredible, like an astronomical amount of reservation. We are both celebrities, okay? In the very specific sense in the fountain pen world, and I, I, I don't, I really don't, I really don't get off on the topic of being a celebrity. But anyway, you are in the public eye, in that very specific niche of a small world of a facet of et cetera, but, but you are in the public eye. So then you do have to have a discussion. What are we going to share online? 
if we go on a date and we have dinner somewhere, are we going to post pictures of that on Instagram or not? And we chose not to. Not because people cannot know. Uh, you could happen to be sitting next to, next to us in the restaurant. But it's more a matter of what do you want to share, right? And what do you not want to share? And sometimes I do share personal things and sometimes I don't. But I think that that's a good way to round this up. But that will be at my discretion and not the discretion of the viewership that says, well, we have a right to know every intimate detail of your life. I'm not Kim Kardashian and I never will be. And I don't want to be either. I don't want to be someone who like every single thing is, is, is publicly posted. I don't judge that. That's a decision that you make. And some people in the pen community are very open about sharing everything. And some people in the pen community are completely closed off and they share nothing. And I'm probably somewhere in the middle. And that's kind of where I, where I like to be. This was an incredibly long answer and I do apologize, but I think it was a very good question. I have not sought to offend anyone with this, but I'm just trying to give you a bit of insight in, in how that how that works for me because I think it was a very fair question. I hope that helps. And I, 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 I have a way sometimes of coming across as um, sounding annoyed or angry or upset. I'm not upset. I'm not angry. I'm not annoyed. Uh, but, 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 but that is how I look at that. So I, I hope that that is a fair answer. All right. I'll just wipe off my tears and continue. <laughs> just kidding. Well, hello there. Well, hello there back. I have quite a scratchy Sailor 1911 nib. It's a medium. What do you think I could do to smoothen it out? Well, it is a Sailor nib. Sailor nibs do often have a little bit more feedback. That is part of a Sailor nib, but you may not like that feedback, but it's typically there. Plus, it's a medium. Being a Japanese nib, that medium is going to be closer in writing to a Western fine. Because it doesn't have that much tipping, it's also going to have a bit more feedback because there is less material to pull it. I do this as if that makes any sense, but there is less material on the tipping material. There is less tipping material to polish. As a result, you're going to have some more feedback. Yeah. What can you do? Well, you could send it to a nibmeister. Again, did a video on that. You could also probably take care of that yourself with some micro mesh, not sandpaper, not a diamond wheel, not uh, concrete. Uh, not a brown paper bag, which is sometimes used, according to Richard Binder, the, I think it was Richard Binder, the, the brown paper bag method just works by filling up the nib slit with fibers, which makes it seem smoother. So you would need some micro mesh, you would need some, some proper micro mesh, something in a very smooth, we call that a very high grit, so very smooth, 12,000 or something, and that you can use very gently, very little attention required. You could try to smoothen it out. Um, and if you don't feel like doing that, there are videos online. I have one, but I think um, I think Matt Armstrong actually had a perfect one, which was more recent, and it was uh, which sorry, which was more recent, and he did a very good thing with all kinds of close-ups. I'm pretty sure he did one. Uh, so the pen habit that was uh, that was a great video on that as well, and that undoubtedly are other videos online as well on how to do it. Make sure to take it easy, and remember that you need way fewer strokes than you think you do. So you don't have to grind away in 12,000 grit micro mesh for half an hour because you won't have any tipping left. Maybe 12,000 grit. Anyway, you understand what I mean? Like it's some, it's just a couple strokes that's typically enough. If you happen to have access to a pen club or something like that in your area, it's possible that there's someone there who has done it before and they can help you out too. I hope that helps. All right. Uh, yes, here's another argument that I, I wanted to put in and I forgot. So, Jenny, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, this goes back to the listing pen prices. Yes, that was another reasoning I had before as well. There are different pen prices in different regions. And if I say this pen is $1,200, then I will get a question along the lines of, but how much is it in euros? How much is it in yen? How much is it in rubles? How much is it? Yeah. There are converters, converters, right? Um, but that was my initial reasoning of, yeah, but in different parts of the world, different prices. I got so many questions about prices, which I think are fair, because if you review a product, people want to know what it costs. It's that simple. And I, I may, it makes sense. 
So I have just opted to give a US dollar price simply because there are a lot of online retailers in the US. So that should at least give you an idea. If you have a local retailer, it's going to be a different price. The Netherlands has a 21% VAT. So that's so like a sales tax. It means pens typically tend to be more expensive in the Netherlands. But if you order them in the US, you have to pay import duties, etc. So that's not easier either. But at least if I say this $200 pen at whatever, uh, whoever sent it to me, Gold Spot, uh, uh, whatever, like, uh, like uh, what do you got, Pen Chalet, etc. Well, then you know that 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 shop, it's that price, at least gives you an impression. So I think that is a completely, I think that is a completely valid, um, did I describe myself as valid? Train of thought, sorry. I think that is a better way to do it because people, it is unfair, I think, to do a review, but then not tell people what a pen costs. So again, the only exception is in specific cases, like, but now I have to make this more concrete because that's fair as well. This is a classic pens LB6. I purchased it with my own hard earned money. This was not sent to me, it was bought by me. I got a discount from Andy Lambrew. I will never tell anyone how much I paid. Why not? Out of respect for Andy, because he gave me a specific discount. Um, that he said was only for me. And I interpret that to mean, do not share that information, please. And then I respect that, right? So if you want to know an LB6 cost, class, what is it? Classicpensinc.com, look it up. And have a respirator standing by, <laughs> unfortunately. But that, that's another reason. So that maybe that, that makes it more concrete. Again, I am very concerned that when I say these things, I sound angry or upset or annoyed. I'm not angry or upset, upset or annoyed. I just try to explain the reasoning process behind that. All good. Let me know if I sounded angry, upset or annoyed. Um, does springiness allow you to make different marks or does it just make writing more pleasant? That's a very good question. And that is something that we should talk about a bit because I think that sometimes people overlook the, the, the complexities of that matter. In a nutshell, some nibs are very stiff or rigid. I like to use the word rigid because I think that sounds a bit better. That means that when you, it doesn't matter how much pressure you exert, well, I shouldn't say that, but if you exert some pressure, nothing's going to happen. The times are going to stay right where they are. They're not going to open up. Some nibs, you see that in a lot of steel nibs, like the real, like for example, Faber Castell nibs. Steel nibs, fantastic nibs, super smooth, but rigid nails. Or a Safari, Lamy Safari nib, super rigid, the, the steel. Gold's a little different, but steel. On the other end of the spectrum, you have like the all the way at the end of the spectrum, you have something like a wet noodle, a vintage 14K flex nib that is so incredibly springy that with the lightest pressure, it opens up completely and it also snaps back. Then there are a lot of nibs somewhere in between. And you cannot say gold nibs are always springier because I've used, I've said this a number of times, but I've used gold nibs that were rigid as nails. 14K gold, 3776 music nib, superb nib, rigid as a nail. Three times 14K, doesn't matter, rigid. At least the one I had, super rigid. And some nibs are in between. Some nibs, steel or gold, will be springier. They'll have a little bit of bounce to them. Now, the question is... Does springiness allow you to make different marks or does it just make writing more pleasant? To me, it makes writing a bit more pleasant. I like it when a nib bounces a bit, has a little bit of yield. To me, that makes the writing more pleasant because it feels softer to me. But now this is where the confusion comes in. Sometimes I have found people think that when a nib is springy, that means they should also exert pressure as they write and treat it as a flex nib. But a flex nib is not the same as a springy nib. A flex nib is really designed to offer line variation. Think of the, the vintage 14K flex nibs. Think of modern nibs, like say the Noodler's nib, which has a very deep slit running down, like really long slit running uh, uh, along the nib that gives more ability for the tines to spread open. Think of something like the Yovo nibs with the sort of like little, what is the shape? This, I think, yeah. <laughs> Um, sort of like a, a cutout on the side, which allows the tines to open up more because there's a cutout on the side. So those nibs are designed 
to offer line variation. But then there are nibs that are springy. A famous example, and I've had these kinds of messages a number of times, the Pelican M1000, not the M800. See, that's probably something that sounded, that sounded angry. Okay, not the M800, but the M1000. Ha ha ha! The M1000, the, the smile, the, the laugh made it less angry sounding. So I'll have to do that every time now. The M1000 <laughs> is a really nice nib because it is a bit springy, okay? But then people buy that pen. It's just softer, bouncier, very pleasant. But then people buy that nib and they treat it as a flex nib. And it's not a flex nib. It's just a nib that has a bit of springiness to it. And then they end up with a sprung nib like this with a tines point to different directions. And then the nib is ruined. Can a nib meister fix it? They can bend it back, but it will always be a weak spot. So then the, I'm not saying that you do this, but then people confuse the term springiness and a flex nib, right? Like it, it doesn't mean that if something has a bit of yield to it, you should push it really hard because that's not what a pen was made to do. Which is why in later reviews, more recent reviews, well, I've been doing that for a while now, I test that bounciness, but I also say be very careful every time. There was a whole thread about this on Fountain Pen Network, how I ruined millions of nibs all over the world by not being careful in how I put that. So I'm always happy to uh, you know, point that out. But that's the matter. Be careful. A fountain pen is not meant to flex unless it is indicated that it is meant to be flexed. So people sometimes conflate those things and they think that because something is bouncy, you can push it really hard and flex it. And in my case, I was not always the intellectually enlightened giant you see before you now. So I sprung my own M1000 nib. I didn't actually, it's not that I actually sprung the nib, but I lifted it off the feed because of too much pressure in writing. Well, that's a consequence. <laughs> This is how you learn. Could be fixed, not a big deal. It wasn't expensive either. They think someone just, I may have done it myself actually, took it out of that. They have this sort of metal ring and took it out and reset re that. Well, that's a problem. And that's what sometimes I, I want to, the reason I spend so much time on this answer is that I, I feel that people often misunderstand that and, and misinterpret the, the springiness to mean this is something that can be flexed to the max. Again, an M1000 nib is not a flex nib, and I get a lot of, this is what I meant earlier, not a lot. I have received over the years a number of messages from people who've literally said this. I got an M1000. I used it, but the tines are now splayed. How can this be? Well, because you exerted too much pressure. You treated it like a flex nib, and in reality, it's not. It's also not marketed as that, right? It doesn't say in the box, please exert as much pressure as you can on this nib. I'm exaggerating now. Ha 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 ha. But like that, that's an issue. So, super long answer. The short answer was, yeah, to me, it just adds a little bit of, I find it pleasant when it bounces a little bit, but I don't write with a lot of pressure. I like that experience, but I don't create line variation as I write, unless I have a pen that can do that. A stipulae truia magnifica, I mentioned before, has a titanium nib. I've pushed pretty hard. It keeps snapping back very nicely. I don't push it too hard. But that's nice. But that's a titanium nib, and that's different from gold nibs. That's a whole different story. Which is your favorite, Montblanc, Da Vinci, or Einstein? I like. Um, I have not used either. I thought the Einstein was very cool, um, but I, I do really like the Montblanc Da Vinci. I do not own it, nor do I have the need to own it. But I do like the looks of it. The, the Einstein is very cool too as well, though. Which pen have you sold that you really regret ever selling? Yeah, I. Uh, one really comes to mind. That was my Omas 360. The Magnum model. And uh, that one I just regretted. I just missed. And I, I got another one. Aziza got me another one. She bought me another one as a gift, which was really sweet because she knew I missed it. What comforts me is that I sold that pen to Ivan, that you may know. Um, 
formerly known as Crazy Ivan uh, on social media, Penn social media, also a blogger, right? Uh, the founder of Penn, Seth Lord. I really enjoy his nice um, affiliation with the Sith. Um, but Ivan uh, uh, bought that pen and he loves it. I hope I now have not said something that was not, no, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, I, I don't think that was that was to be kept a secret, but he, he owns it and it was a grail pen for him and he loves it and he still posts pictures with it and how much he loves it, et cetera. So I, I, um, uh, that, that's good. That means that I miss it less because I know that it went to someone who, who was that pen. So that, that makes it a lot better. Really appreciate your thoughts about Myers-Briggs. Yeah. This is another example. I was not trying to be mean or anything, right? No, I don't know if that was right. I don't know if that was clear, but I wasn't trying to be mean. But of all these things, ask yourself how it's used. I think it is wrong to use that in a scientific way. But again, if you use that for personal growth and you are aware that maybe it's not a perfect measure if there's such a thing, but there are more validated personality measures, uh, neo Neo Pi R, for example, it's a really weird name, but Neo Pi R, that's much better, but that's also not necessarily super easily available to, to the public because there is a scientific test, but that is validated and is reliable and is continuously supported by research and does correlate with all the right things. And the Myers-Briggs indicator does almost none of those things. But again, take it for what it is. You're, if you are a, a lay person, and that's not meant in a, in a derogatory fashion, but in, in, if you're using that measurement tool as a lay person, then you're not using it for scientific research. And that already makes things different. Then you are using it for personal growth to get inside and things. And then it becomes a somewhat different story, as long as you are aware of some of the limitations of that tool. <sighs> what else do we have? Oh, I overscrolled. Where was I? I think it was about there. Is the Visconti quality control still as bad as it used to be, or did they improve? Um, I have not used their gold nibs, the recent gold nibs, so I can't really speak to that. It's always difficult because there also are people who have no issues with the Visconti quality control, but that's the issue, right? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of a random draw. So there is that. Um, as to their actual pens, yeah, I haven't used a new Visconti in a while. Do I have anything on the way? I don't know. I don't know. I have to check. This remains an interesting, um, interesting phenomenon. Have you used Akamon number three, Akamon Blau? I'm thinking. Um, I haven't, I don't think I've used number three. No, I've used the Delft's Blau, which I like a lot. It's a little dry, but it's a very nice washable blue. Honestly, with the Akamon inks, I, can I say that? Think, think, think. Yeah, I, I haven't really had any issues. Chinatown Red remains um, a really nice uh, red. I've always really liked. I like their Marvel's House Magenta, um, Trèves Turquoise. There are a lot of really neat options yeah, that I, I really, really enjoyed. I agree 100% the pen should be used. I hate the idea of Stradivarius violence kept locked up in a safe. Yes, I... I uh, yeah, yeah, same thing here. Like you, you, you have, especially with pens which are not, fortunately, often the price of of a Stradivarius. But the, the, use it. It's a tool to be used, and if you can, of course, do your best to keep things pristine. But but think about what it means. I mean, is this really something that you want to keep in a pristine condition for posterity or do you just want to use it? For me, it's always been use, use it. And again, other people disagree and they keep the pens and the packaging on a shovel. Sure, but that's not, that's not the way I, I do it. Has anyone ever tested or calculated the average volume of ink per word with different nibs, papers and inks? 
I have I have I do not know of this um, um, having happened, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if if someone uh, would have done something along those lines. If not, it might be a nice task for you. And let's start to do it. Let's start tomorrow. Um, oh yeah, I will scroll again. Yeah, a lot actually. Oh, heavens, what was I? Um, oh, I really over scrolled. Oh, was I? How can this be? Ah, there we were. Oh, the professor coming up. Which pen you regret saying the most? That one I just answered. What else do we have? What are your views of the new Parker 51? Yeah, I the Parker 51 never did much for me. Uh, again, with all respect for the, it's, it's, it's very important role in pen history, but I, I'm not a fan of the model. So, um, I, uh, I will check it out, but I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume in this case for me, it would be a keeper. A4 size paper block with squared line of blank paper, your favorite. The, uh, what do we have? Yeah, I, uh, Oxford, uh, Oxford remains a, a notepad that I really, really like. I really like their paper. It's coated with something, but it is, it is very, it's very nice paper to me. During this corona time, what is the longest you waited for a shipment coming from Europe? Um, I ordered a book in the UK at some point, which I think took two and a half months. That was a new record. I'm still awaiting something from the UK with bated breath. I was not there yet. We shall see. How is your college going to handle opening the new semester? Uh, everything will be online, which comes with its own set of challenges. But I do think that um, that was the wisest decision this time. So I, I do, I do think that was that was the decision I would have made as well. Which of course will have some challenges, but it'll it'll happen. It'll it'll happen, and everything will work out one way or the other. I'm sure. Do Canadians and the Dutch pity us Americans? Um, I I do look with much consternation at the what is going on in the United States in many ways. Um, pity, I'm not sure is the right word, but continuous marvel uh, on my part more so, I would say. And I'm not, this is not a statement of blame, but with coronavirus cases rising and rising and rising and rising, some, some marvel, I would say, is in place at some point, yeah. Is there a difference between an elastic nib and a springy one, or are they one and the same? I want to say, yes, there is a difference, because I once was lectured by someone online who raised some very good points on this. Um, and I forgot most of the arguments. So I want to say yes, and I would, I would lean towards saying an elastic nib really is designed to, to be used I'm hesitant to say in, in a flex writing manner, but is designed to have that sort of snap back. And a springy nib just may be a somewhat softer alloy that opens and closes up a little bit as you write, but it's not designed to do that. But I could be wrong. I am not a flex nib person. I'm just not. It's not my handwriting style. It's not something I really use a lot. You should ask Aziza. Because she's the flexy lady. She knows. What else do you have? Lamy All-Star Termaline or Studio Glacier? I have to look them up. I have to come back to this next time. I haven't seen them. I haven't seen... I have this in my... The Termaline, yes. But the Studio Glacier, I haven't seen. Sorry. 
Does the single chamber power chamber in the Homo sapiens Bronze Age seal off like a VAC 700 or Pilot A23? In the double chamber power fillers, yes, it does. In the single chamber, I am not sure. I'm not sure. I'm thinking of the old, I had one strange sort of syringe-like uh, power filler. Um, I think it did seal because I think, sorry, it was, this is thinking back to a long time ago. I think it did seal because to, to make, to, to keep it writing, I had to pull out the end a bit, I think. Any hair care tips? Yeah, well, as I said, at some point, I'm approaching a point where I have no hair, I think. I'm not quite there yet, but look at it from the sides. It's happening. So my hair care tip is I don't care about the hair, I think. All right. What else do we have? I've been into your philosophy videos lately and they're absolute shit no that's not i said i've been your philosophy videos lately i'm going to start reading through the meditations keep reflection journal do you have any other book suggestions yes um uh, uh, uh the um the enchiridion i'm sorry but is by epictetus epictetus the enchiridion that's what the uh the earliest like the actual start all the way back in the, the stoicism playlist I went through that book. That is also very interesting to read. And the discourses by Epictetus are more of an elaboration, but the, the, the Enchiridion is a very good place to start. Is there a discernible difference between celluloid and acrylic pens in terms of tactile feel? Uh, yes, I find that, but do not expect a night and day difference uh, because there isn't. I, I find celluloid to me to the touch is a little warmer somehow, but but it's really, I think there's a lot of psychological issues in that as well, because I think that if you were to blindfold me and give me a couple of celluloid and a couple of acrylic pens, I really don't know I'd be able to tell you the difference. So probably a bit of a feeling as well. Is Esbiri brown ink from Akaman water washable? Well, it's not water resistant. It's not a waterproof ink. Um, I haven't tried to actually eradicate it completely. I haven't so far, knock on wood, uh, spilled it on clothes or something, which is a miracle. Uh, but I, I don't know. I haven't tried this. Anderson Pens does a great job with vintage. Yes, that's another interesting input. So if you're looking for vintage, this goes back a bit, but if you go back to, sorry, if you are looking for vintage pen parts, uh, um, Anderson Pens does have some, but then I think of a lot of supply type stuff like sacks and, and, and levers and that kind of stuff. What else do you have? Cashew milk may be useful when you cook Indian kormas, but you're probably better off using raw cashews and blending it to make sauce. Yeah, I do. I do. When I do make butter chicken, I should make butter chicken. Anyway, um, then I, I do put in some cashews. Yes, that's true. It is very good. When you grind it up, it's very good. Oh, that's really neat. Thank you, Kiara. It's uh, Kiara, sorry. It is washable, as Barry Brown, in the sense you can remove it with an eradicator pen. I didn't know that, but I don't have one, but I do know what you're talking about. That's neat. I haven't tried that. Thank you. That's a nice contribution. Thank you. Now, as we have, hi from South Africa. Hi back. Um, you are a college professor, pr professor, professor professionally, yes. May I ask what field you teach? Yes, of course. Uh, I teach psychology, but not clinical psychology because I'm not a clinical psychologist. I teach psychology with an emphasis on cognitive things and brain brain stuff. So more, more cognitive psychology slash cognitive neuroscience. And also I'm to teach statistics, which is something I like a lot. <laughs> but in a classroom of 40, I may be one of the two or three people who actually enjoy that course. Um, by the way, did he talk about the new Parker 51? Yes, he did. 
Um, I've noticed that people at meetups are drawn to particular types of pens. I've always wondered if it's more an aesthetic preference. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I know. Th uh, somebody don't say the question. No, that's okay. But, but yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think the aesthetic preference is. Is definitely a very important aspect. Of course, I mean you, you select the pen that you like the looks of, and of course. Um, but I do think there are certain preferences in, in in people. Yes, like as I said, I mean the 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 the, the, the very. I'm just using this not in, in a judgmental fashion, but the super gaudy designs, and then there is the super sleek minimalist designs, and then there's a host of pens in between. And sometimes I like the gaudy designs. Uh, that is absolutely true, and and like take take the uh, I know I've shown this a number of times, but take the this Visconti Speakeasy. I really like the size of this pen. I like the shape. I like the way it writes, but it's with its hidden alcohol compartment. It's that in my mind that is definitely getting to the gaudy point. If that's just weird, but I really like it. You know, yeah. All right. Uh, have you had a pen that you sold you regret selling? Yes, I've answered that a while ago. There is a lag. So when you ask a question, it will take a while for me to get there. A few of my jackets have special pockets for regular sized pens. I thought it was normal to carry a regular sized pen in your pocket and call that a pocket pen. Oh, well, there's nothing. I mean, there's nothing to... Um, um, yes, that it does make sense. But that, that, was, that was always trying to say. There are specific pens marketed as pocket pens, which are smaller. And that goes back long ago. You, you, all the way in the vintage pen era, you had vest pens, which were also small, so you could put in, in the vest pocket. So that, that was all the only point I was trying to make. Like you, you, of course, any pen can be stuffed in a pocket, of course. Um, but pocket pens are just a specific class of pens. So that, that, that was all. That was all. And there was no harm intended or any uh, offense intended either. But but that's that's the that's the distinction and of course you, you could but a lot of people also when they talk about pocket carry they don't talk about um, coats I found um, but they are talking about taking a pen putting it in pants pockets like jeans pockets and such and of course you can also use any pen like that but then again is it a pocket pen or is it a pen in your pocket right that's that's maybe the, uh, the, the difference all right um what else do we have? Got about half an hour left. My Wing Sung 626 converter loads a bit, and the little amount of ink that loads appears stationary rather than sloshing. Maybe an airlock. Possible. Same pen and burps at times. I don't know what type of converter that is. If it's if it's one of those aerometric squeeze types, or if it's something with a with a, a piston in it. I found. Typically, the aerometric converters to be variable. That's putting it very kindly. They often don't fill up all the way. You know, you, you can expel, draw up some more. But I, I'm I'm not a huge fan of those types of converters. Um, you could try really cleaning the converter by degreasing it. If you just take a little bit of something like ammonia or even dishwasher detergent, that can work too if you don't want to use ammonia. Uh, in not pure form, but diluted in some water, you draw that up, you, you expel that to make sure that there's no stickiness on the side of the converter on the inside because then ink may not flow so well and you, you may have issues with surface tension and such. Do you think fountain pen collecting can get boring as the technology materials and nibs are limited? It can, yeah, it can. Um, be it can be, but then you have to find other ways to keep things interesting. I think I did a video on that at some point. How to keep keep pen stuff interesting? How are taxes for sending pens to a knitmeister to work on? I live in Central Asia and I'm confused where to send them: USA, Europe, or Japan. Uh, that really depends on the knitmeister. I just got a bill from Mike Masayama, uh, who's in LA, and. There was no sales tax on that, but that may depend on the state in the U.S. Uh, where it's going. Sometimes when you purchase from another country, they have to pay sales tax. So if I, if it's, let's say Europe, the Netherlands has a twenty-one percent VAT, but if you send in a product or buy, let's say that way, purchase a product or a service in the EU while you are not in the EU, then you don't have to pay that sales tax. The simplest solution is ask the Nibmeister, right? Because they'll be able to inform you what their, their policy is and where they are and that kind of stuff. 
What else? When you have to send a reviewed pen to another reviewer, who pays for shipping? Now, that's a good question. Uh, usually, it, it doesn't happen very often, but it happens occasionally. Usually, it's the company. Uh, so the company send, uh, sends a pen to reviewer X, and then reviewer X sends it to reviewer Y, and then uh, reviewer X sends a bill to that original company that, that sent that pen out. Yeah. Could you please show your Arco Oldwin? Is that a is that a pickup line? Show me your Arco Oldwin. No, I'm just kidding. Yes, I can. This is an Arco Oldwin. I haven't got the facets lined up perfectly now, but I. I don't really want to either, but they, they, they can be made to line up. I like the Arco Oldman. It's a very, very comfortable pen. The design they, they made on these is, is superb, really, really comfortable to use. Any opinion on Russian tea? Do you know what variety it is? Someone once gave me a Russian tea. I was actually a student who was done with the course, gave me Russian tea. And it was a uh, very interesting. It was a... Uh, we looked it up because he only knew the Russian name, but we looked it up and it was a type of thyme, as in T-H-Y-M-E, right? Uh, it's a type of thyme. It was actually very good. Yep. And Mikado. Yeah, I can also show that. This is a Mikado. Danny Trio, right? Also a superb pen. With a Mike Masayama tune nib. Oh, it is superb pen. Could you compare the various nibs like Yovo, Schmidt, Nemo, Sign, Box, Sailor, Knox, Platinum, Sailor, uh, uh, Namiki, Plat Parker, Waterman? Uh, no, probably not. Because there are so many nibs out there. Um, I can think about what I have that is Bach or Yovo, but then I don't. There's also steel versus gold. That would re really require some coordination and planning because I don't have every nib I ever made. So it, it would be a, something I have to think about what I have and what I can use. Ellen says, I did get a white shirt back to its pristine state after a user-induced terrible accident with SBRE Brown. Excellent. Now we know. Yes, it is not a permanent ink, indeed. Crone says, my Shakespeare pen has a friction nib and feed. No word if all others are that way, though. I don't know. Uh, I saw the email he sent this morning about that. Um, so I can answer it now. I don't know because I've never used a Crone pen. If one model is friction fit, I would assume that that is what they typically do but I can't guarantee it so it's an empirical question that has to be um, answered by by Crone probably but yeah is there anything in particular about founder pens things related to founder pens that annoys you uh, well the prices <laughs> the prices annoy me um, sometimes quite a lot because especially these days it's very common to see a pen and you think, I like that pen. I want to buy that pen. And then you go to check out and then it's a $2,000 pen, which I've seen it grow from 500 to 1,000 to basically 2,000 is common for new pens coming up now. And I think that's becoming a little absurd. That annoys me. What are your top five to six pocket pens in terms of function and value? I don't have a top five. I really like that Enzo XS pocket pen. I have a, I have an inventory. Sorry, my that was my battery. There we go. I have an inventory pocket pen, which I like because it has a little piece in between that you can take out and put in if you want it longer or shorter. That's pretty much it. I don't own any Cavecos, although they're nice pens. I just don't own any. Um, that's it. I don't have, I don't, I don't use a lot of pocket pens, but that's, uh, that's, that Enzo XS, I, I really like, I don't know why, it's, it's the facets, I just like it, it's just a very, to me, it's a very pleasant pen to use. Um, what else do we have? The image of S.B. Brown as Kim Kardashian is rather disturbing. <laughs> One now inflicted upon my memory. Yes, I do apologize. I was aware of that as I was 
going through it. Maybe next time when we're here, I shall do this in a leopard print bikini. Now, um, not everyone is nice to you. If you tell the price of a pen, they start criticizing in a mean way, I guess. That does happen, and of course, that is, that is their, their, their choice. They can, they can do that, um, but that is not, not always easy. But, I mean, you also... I, the, the, I'll be very brief about this because we talked about this for a very long time. So another thing is I can purchase a pen and uh, then someone can tell me that is ridiculously expensive. Why would you spend that much on a pen? Well, that's, that's my business, right? So like, I, I, I don't need that judgment. Like if you do not want to do that, then you're welcome not to do that. But I chose to do, do that. And for me at that point, that was worth it. And we probably disagree on that and that's okay. But yeah, like I know, I know it's expensive. You know, like I, I, I was aware of that. That's another thing that, that does indeed sometimes happen. All right. Uh, nice. I was just about to bust out my concrete slab to smooth my sailor nib. Nice, nice, nice. The new hit color pens from Crown Dash 849 founder pens in cool yellow, red, green, black, purple, or white for 55 euros. The coolest founder pens in 2020 on the founder pen market or too cheap for you. No, I don't care about cheap or expensive. There, there are some pens that are very affordable and that are great pens. There are many, actually, I think, that are, are great pens. Um, but I'll have to check them out. Crown Dash is another brand that I'm not, like, I, I, I haven't really ever found to be my absolute favorite simply because often they're on the very thin end of the spectrum. And I, for me, that's not very comfortable to use. That's not a fold of pen. That's just, to me, that's not very comfortable to use. SBRE Brown looking like a wise philosopher. Yes, yes. Yes, 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 yes. That's the beard, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, I too have a sale abroad. Uh, in an imperial black and it starts too wet and dries out on its own and becomes wet again. Anything I can do to fix it? Um, yeah, it sounds like a bit of ink starvation. First try with another ink source. If you do that with a converter, just use a, uh, use a cartridge. If it still does that, uh, there may be an issue of the feed or the nib or the setting of the feed and nib. That's not necessarily super easy to fix. But if it suddenly works a lot better, then maybe the converter, that there's a good fit between the converter and the nipple in the in the section. I've had that, like with the old one, I couldn't use it with the converter that came with it, but I can use it with a card with a cartridge. At some point I'll probably get a converter for it. But right now it's fine because it just refilled a big waterman cartridge, which holds more ink than a converter anyway. Can you please post a picture of your collection on Instagram? I guess. Yes. I guess I could do that if, but the problem is it's going to be such a, like, it, it, it's not that it's that many, but you won't be able to see much detail because if they all have to fit in one picture, it's going to be squished. So I don't see the point of it, but theoretically, of course I could. Yes. What pens do you use for work? Um, all actually, everything I own, I, I use uh, for work at work. Yeah. I was thinking of purchasing a Pilot high-end, but is plastic. I like a lot Lamy 2000 instead. What nib should I order? I draw with, draw with them. I would, I'm not someone who draws with pens, but then I would probably go for something in the finer end of the spectrum, but that would be my impression and I could be utterly wrong because again, I don't really, I don't really use, um, use them like that. Yes, you do sound annoyed and angry. I don't sound, sorry, I'm so sorry. No, I do not sound annoyed. Yes, I know. Sometimes I do, and it's not meant. It's not meant in a in a in a bad way. But I sometimes think that is my uh, that's my nature. It doesn't mean I am angry. I've always had that. No, but it's weird because I was already like I was told that when I was four years old. Like you always sound so serious and makes you sound angry. Yeah, where well, I am, I suppose. I'm aware of it. I'm trying to change it, but. Anyway, uh, springiness isn't flex. It refers to snapback. A springy nib closes instantly after flexing the tines. Excellent. Now we know. Hakase pen vids show pen pro determining uh, one's approximate angle and pen holding style by writing interview. What if you can't get to Japan? Um, 
I suppose someone could indeed, as you suggest, write a phone app for that. Um, it is it is a matter, yeah, yeah. But the hacker say, I know they ask you about the angle, which is great that they that they tune the nib like that. Um, but yeah, you do not sound angry or annoyed. Perfectly agree and respect your responses. Thank you, I appreciate it. All right, spring isn't the same as flex. Yes, we got, I think we, you said that, yes. A flix, a, sorry, a flix nib, what? A, a flix nib, that sounds pretty cool. A flex nib can have spring softness and flex. Yeah, I, it's not a distinction I make, but I know it is there. But again, I, as I said, I'm not, I'm not really a flex nib user. So I know there are very stringent peculiarities as to how everything should be labeled. And I, 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 I don't, because I don't know. So I appreciate the, the, the input, yes. Um, there we go. What else do we have? Um, what else do we have? What else do we have? Thank you, Frank. I see you too. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Ellen, I will stop laughing. That laughter was scary. <laughs> I can be very creepy if I want to be. Okay. <laughs> you managed to bend an Omas extra flexible in a minute. Yes, I did. I forget what the context of this issue was, but yes, no, it, it happened. I, I came in from work and Aziza said, you should try this and it was sprung. Again, I'm not a flex and abuser. I'm not, but I, I don't see the need for it. The thing is, if you want to do calligraphy with flex nibs, you have to use a dip nib. They are, they are designed to do that and modern, Pens are not. How we've said this a lot of times now. Modern flex nibs just are not the same as the the, the vintage flex nibs. So that to me is the is the issue. The um, um, vintage versus modern versus dip nibs for true flex writing. If you do copper plate style. I think that's almost impossible to do with a fountain pen, also because of the angle that you require for that. All right. What else? You don't seem angry. Sometimes you are susceptible. Yes, this I am. I've bought nibs that were marked flex, but ended up being only soft. Still nothing like a vintage flex. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was trying to say. Like it's even the modern flex nibs. There have been so many incarnations now with cutouts like this and cutouts like that and slits like this. And I, I still think that that you 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 do not we do not have anything that truly truly emulates the vintage flex nibs. <laughs> I'm not gonna let that one go now. I'm gonna incorporate this laugh into things. All right. What else? Yes, yes. Yeah, the LB6 is, yeah, 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 that was a good point. It's not just a respirator, it's also a defibrillator. Yes. Uh, what else do we have? We have about 17 minutes. What was the noise? It's very windy out. I'm 10 inches. I'm windy too. <laughs> when you laugh at your own jokes, so that's a bad thing. Okay. What else do we have? Hello, hello, Queen Cats. What do you think about the Moon Man C1? Um, I think I used one. I think it was good. Yeah, that's a while ago. All right. All right, all right, all right. What else do we have? Sorry, I'm just reading this as I go. So I'm sorry if I fall silent. There's no, it's not out of boredom or anything along these lines. Um,
Have you used an OmniFlex nib? Yes, I'm pretty sure. And I have used, um, I have used it and reviewed it. So I, I was organizing my thoughts as I went along. Also, thank you, Brandon, for this. You see, that sounded, that sounded condescending. I know it did, but that's not what I meant. I, I meant sincerely, yes, thank you, Brandon. That sounded, God damn it, that sounded condescending again. Thank you, Brandon. I appreciate what you said. You said, um, spring isn't the same as flex. It's a quality that correlates with flex. A flex nib is either springy or it isn't. Springy doesn't make the nib flexy. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so he went on, Brendan went on to say, um, no, I lost this comment. Here we go. A flex nib has multiple qualities. A flex nib can be springy, soft, and flexy. Flex means how far the tines spread apart. Softness is how much pressure it takes to flex. Springiness is how fast the tines snap back after being flexed. That is the clearest definition I've ever seen on that. And I'm very grateful. Take a screenshot right now so I never forget. Because again, I do forget. This was very clear. Thank you. I appreciate that. Ah! I probably shouldn't have done that at that point, but no, I'm serious. I, I do really appreciate that because I always get confused about the terms. This is correct, and now I stand corrected, and I appreciate that. Um, have you ever come across a pen with a nib that was too big such that it was uncomfortable to use? No, I don't think I have. For some people, I have because of the way, like a nib... If this makes sense, a nib removes your fingers farther from the paper, and some people struggle with that, but I, I haven't really experienced that. All right. What's your favorite TV show? You know, I don't actually own a TV. What? Yes. So, so that answers that question, I think. Is a medium good for the pilot vanishing point or the broad better? They're both good nibs. But it depends on your handwriting. That will determine what you need but both will be good nibs. All right. Um, what nib size is the best for Lamy 2000? Again, they will all be good nibs. It's just a matter of your handwriting. What do you what do you need for that handwriting? If you have very large handwriting and you get an extra fine nib, your handwriting will look weird. And if you have super, super tiny handwriting and you use a broad nib, then your handwriting will be illegible. So you just have to adjust it to the specific uh, demands. All right, we continue. Have you ever had a modern celluloid pen that has shrunk or warped? Do you worry about them and do you do anything special to care for them? No, I try to store them in a way where there is a bit of uh, air so they, they, they can outgas if necessary. I haven't experienced this, knock on wood, but I, uh, no, I have not. <clears throat> Would you say micro mesh is enough to smoothen your nib or will I need mylar paper? I think if you use micro mesh, it'll be fine, but do you use the proper grit? Because for example, 2000 grit micro mesh is not going to smooth your nib, but it's going to grind away the tipping. So something like 12,000 grit would be a good, good place to start. What else do we have? I've been having a rough time in the past weeks and I always look forward to these. Thank you for doing these. I don't think you're the only one who is struggling maybe a bit more than usual now. And um, that is also a reason for me to want to do this because life is hard enough as it is on the best of days. And with everything going on in the world right now, um, some things have become a bit harder still. And that sucks. So if, if these videos add something and, and, and are something that, that can help you to, to get through the day a little bit, and give you something to look forward to, then I'm very happy because that, that makes this... Um, very worthwhile. Not that it's not otherwise, but then I mean, I, I know it has special meaning. So I appreciate that. 
All right. Opus 88, what are your thoughts? Good brand. I like it. I like it. It's a nice brand. They make nice pens. I have yet to see an Opus 88. Not that I've used dozens, but I've used a number. I found all the nibs to write well. I love the one-way shadow fail filling system, so I really like it. I really like it. All right. Ten minutes. Yeah, yeah, Jenny, yeah, don't, don't think I haven't thought about it. Could you put ink? See, that probably sounded, that may have sounded condescending as well. So let me say it in a happy way. <laughs> yeah, I thought about that too. Could you put ink in the speakeasy pen and then refill the pen with it? I thought about it. I've never tried it. The problem is I can't fit a good converter in it because it has a very small space behind the section because of the alcohol compartment. Theoretically, you could carry a little syringe with you and refill a cartridge. But then if it's like, did you know how fast you were going? Then I think you may have a thing or two to explain, you know? I don't really speed anyway, but you know, you know what I'm talking about. Is 18K material better for flex nibs than 14K? No, I think actually nib meisters always prefer 14K. And I think 14K um, has is a bit better for Flex, even though you may think 18K more gold content, softer, etc. But I think for the um, springiness, correct me if I'm wrong, but for that snapback, the 14K is better than the 18K because of the other, other materials in the alloy. Earliest Grail pen you can remember. Um, May have been the the Omas 360 because I did really enjoy that. I remember really looking for that and finding it. Yeah. Is it my imagination, or in general, Mont Blanc inks have a very restricted flow? No, it's your imagination. Uh, but it depends. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. But I mean, it 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 depends on the ink, the pens you use. I have used. I think I have used. It's not a huge lineup. I think I've used them all at one point or another, and I've never had issues with them. I've heard it from other people, but I have used them in a large number of pens, and I've never had issues. I've used them in the uh, uh, Conid, the king size fine nib. I use uh, Irish green a lot, and I've never had issues. It's a fine nib, but I've never had reduced ink flow or dryness. It, it writes like a dream, so it, it may be a bit of an interaction between the pen and the ink as well. I bought... An old mask Paragon two years ago. It's in pristine condition. What would be a, a fair selling price? I'm not the best person to ask um, that, but it depends a bit on the material. If it's Arco, then I don't know, $20,000 at this point. I think that, that's, that's just insane. Um, that, that's an exaggeration. But then you can probably get away with 1500 or 2000 US. If it is a different material, then it really depends on the material. Um, because some of the Omar celluloids are more sought after than the others. So then we really depend. And I can't really advise you very well on that. But that is the question I would ask the Founder Pen Network, because there would be there will be a lot of people there who will help you out and will be um, much more knowledgeable because I don't I don't sell enough like I sell something that's a personal collection thing. Um so I would ask them. But Omar's prices have gone up, but again, depending on the material as well. All right. Yes. Yesterday I came across a poem from Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. Yes, yes, yes. The road less travel and all that stuff. I have not discussed that on my channel, I think, but that is interesting and I will think about that. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Your website address, please. It's sbrebrown.com. At least assuming that we're talking about my website, sbobrown.com. What else do we have? We've got five minutes. How do your students react to your pens? Uh, often with a bit of surprise for us, like some I have, I have, and this is not meant in any uh, bad way, but like, what is that? Because some, we live in a world where not everybody has ever seen a fountain pen. Um, also a lot of reactions, oh, I haven't seen a fountain pen in a long time, or oh, that's a really fancy pen. Um, that all happens. And some also find the YouTube channel and then 
uh, it's never led to anything uh, uh, anything bad. Usually, it's to interesting conversations. Yeah, yeah. I'd say, I I I say that because sometimes people ask me like, is it are you are you afraid that students find out about the the YouTube channel? Well, not really. I mean, it's a personal channel, and it just gives them an insight in. I think it's like positive because it gives me insight in the fact that I also have a life outside of being their instructor, which is not meant to sound dramatic, but like sometimes you can forget that like we are people too, right? And we do things. This may be an interesting, not necessarily super common hobby, but but it is a thing. All right. Well, there we go. Will Penflush remove the image of Stephen in a leopard skin bikini from my brain? No, nothing can do that. But if you purchase this pen, which happens to be for sale, then um, it's possible that you will lose it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, Bella review. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get a Bella. Yep, I'll try to get a Bella. Bella. Is it Bella or Bela? Bella Bela. Bella. Oh, that's an interesting viewpoint. I'm angry all the time, but I never sound angry. I sound calm and grounded. That's the other way around, I guess. Do many of your professor colleagues use fountain pens? Not a lot. There are a few, but not a whole lot. Um, but there are a few. There are a few. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Nice, nice. Um, we are slowly coming to the end of this because we've been doing this for almost two hours. So, Let's return next week and have another session. I have tried to, again, it was a late night, so I've tried to keep my mind as organized as I could. I thank you all very much um, for being here because it's always a pleasure. So I see one question in the corner of my eye. Why do you want to sell the yard letter? I thought you loved it so much. Yeah, yeah, I do. That's not the one I'm selling. There is the small one and this is the big one. The big one's mine, but the small one's for sale. If you want it, contact me. Uh, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. I, I always enjoy uh, uh, hanging out with you all and, and, and trying to answer questions about all kinds of things. If I sounded angry, ah! it wasn't really meant that way. And I will uh, I'll work on that. I'm not less angry. Maybe I should, maybe I should smile more. It's not better, is it? No, that's worse. That's why I am the way I am. Sorry. Um, I will see you next week. Thank you all for being here. I will say the same thing that I say every time because I just uh, because I just do. Um, I do get the question. What can we do to support you? And then uh, here's something you could do to support me, if you want to, but you don't have to. Patreon.com/sbarybrown for as little as one dollar a month, you can support me. You don't have to, and if you don't, I love you just as much. But there are people who do support me that way, and it's always very nice. Right. So I always appreciate that. If you had that in mind of what could I do to support this amazing specimen of humankind, well, that's something you could do. You could consider it. But um, but you could also not. And that's okay, too. So thank you all for being there. I appreciate it. Uh, next time I'll I'll have probably have had a longer night. I hope this was useful. I wish you all a very good week. With or without <laughs> leopard print bikinis. Where do I get a leopard print bikini? Anyway, and I shall be here again next week. Maybe emphasizing my new Kim Kardashian image. I need makeup too, makeup tutorial. Anyway, see you then. Have a good week. Bye.